Welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened. This week we're going to be discussing the impacts of being raised by narcissistic parents with our guest Alana Donovan Mackinson, who holds an MA in clinical mental health counseling from the University of Cincinnati. Alana is the owner and founder of Life Tree Counseling located in Cincinnati, with an additional anticipated location in Northern Virginia. With the partnership of her therapy dogs, Quigley and Lydia, Alana provides mental and emotional health counseling services to clients who are seeking to nurture their mind, body, and spirit. She serves as a treatment provider for clients suffering from anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, and personality disorders. Alana's work centers around helping clients heal the wounds of the past, make peace with emotions, find and deepen meaningful connection in relationships, and enhance their overall quality of life. Her practice caters to the needs of sexual minority populations and non-traditional relationships, including adult individuals and couples practicing consensual non-monogamy and the LGBTQIA community at large. Alana believes that healthy, meaningful connection to other people, animals, and nature is vital to well-being and that we best facilitate our personal growth when we invest in the holistic nurturing of our physical bodies, mental health, and spiritual selves. Alana, thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I love your guys' show, so I really appreciate the invitation. Oh, thank Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I feel that the hardest part of being raised by a narcissistic parent is this conspiracy of secrecy that often evolves in narcissistic families, where no one really talks about it. Can you help listeners understand what this is like by giving us some telltale signs that your parent possibly was indeed a narcissist? I think that's a really good point, Samantha, because I think um, some of the the tactics and behaviors that you'll see in families where at least one parent is narcissistic, it can be really hard, especially when you've grown up in that kind of environment your whole life you don't know anything different from that so it can be hard to even realize that maybe there's some behaviors that aren't the most healthy or that help the child to autonomize Um, it can be kind of insidious and and hard to detect so i think i'm really happy that we're having this conversation because um, there are some things you can look for to kind of tell if uh, that is an environment in which um, you did experience some of those things um, and kind of start parsing some of that out. So what would some of those signs be? Is, I mean, is it just a selfish parent or is it more than that? Narcissism. So when you're looking at narcissism, I think first there is, we've got to remember that it exists on a spectrum. So it can be anything from somebody uh, being, you know, a little bit into how they look to all the way full-blown narcissism where they have to, they, they kind of feel um, the sense of needing to put other people down in order to elevate themselves almost, which, you know, the dynamics there can, it, it, it makes it really hard to um, deal with somebody like that. And I think we've got to remember, we've got to have, in in a way, it, it does not excuse any abuse that can come from narcissistic parents, but I think it's important to remember that at the core, there's this insecurity that they have, um, and it's almost a way of like overcompensating for that. So they'll take advantage of other people. I think is is really the best way to say it to kind of put themselves up on a pedestal and kind of reassure themselves that almost like they're better than other people. I think a really interesting way to look at it is one example would be the narcissistic parent might say, I'm cold, go put on your coat. They, they kind of see their kids as an extension of themselves and almost forget that the child has their own autonomy, if that makes sense. It does. And I think one of the most dangerous things that narcissistic parents do is they triangulate the siblings where it's often they'll pick one to be the favorite or they'll label each child and they tend to pit them against each other so that even growing up in that unstable environment, the siblings can't really rely on each other for support often. Yes, labeling is definitely something you will see over and over again in narcissistic 
families. You know, it's interesting. I, I think you can think of it kind of in this way. In a healthy family, think of, think of a triangular structure where you've got the parent or the parents at the top and their, their job is to protect and to meet the needs of the children. So from the top of the triangle, the, there's like an energy that flows to the children to protect them, to meet their needs, to keep them safe, that kind of thing. In a narcissistic family, on the other hand, you've got, think of like the target bullseye. You've got the parent or parents in the middle of that bullseye, and then the children are revolving in the circle around the parents, trying to cater to their needs so that the children can get needs that they have met from the parent. They, they, they learn that the way that I get my needs met is by meeting the parents' needs. So it's kind of like the target bullseye where they're revolving around the parents trying to meet the parents' needs. And yeah, parents are really good at uh, pitting kids against each other almost to try to encourage the child to meet the needs of the parent. I think it's very interesting that a lot of times as empaths, a lot of our behaviors as adults mimic so closely having grown up in maybe a home that had substance abuse. And I think that there's a really strong correlation behaviorally between that type of environment, alcoholism, addiction, any type of thing, and growing up with a narcissistic parent who may not actually be partaking in those uh, a drug of choice. It's almost like the narcissism becomes a drug of choice. Do you have any insight on that? Yes, 100%. Denise, I think that's a really good way to put it, actually. Narcissism is, it, you can almost look at it and conceptualize it like an addiction almost, and you will see similar traits uh, in the way that like the narcissistic family operates and the addictive family operates. And in fact, um, interestingly enough, sometimes you'll have uh, families where there is a healthy dynamic that goes on, but then when one parent is under more stress or they are struggling with substance abuse or something like that, that's when the narcissistic traits will come out. Um, so what ends up happening is um, like how we were talking about the, the children kind of revolve around the parents trying to meet their needs. So the children will develop this really, it's like this superpower of sensitivity where they're always kind of trying to predict what the parent will need next. And they get really, really in tune to the parents' emotions and they pick up on really subtle cues that, that, over time, they've learned um, when this happens, this is this is kind of the next thing that happens after that. Like they they learn and they almost uh, kind of develop the superpower. Well, I've got to predict this, and they end up getting really, really in tune to emotions and other people's emotions. And yeah, in a way, it, it does kind of almost become like a superpower almost. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, then sometimes it can be kind of overwhelming to have to live with that and deal with that for the rest of their lives. Not that they have to, but, but yeah. It becomes a habit. You know, it, Dr. Julie Bichelle of the Winbridge Institute is actually researching this right now because she's been researching mediums for years and she discovered that many mediums have chronic illness. So she started looking into why do they have chronic illness? You know, is it that doing mediumship is taking their energy and creating this illness? And what she discovered through the research is no, it actually goes back to stress in the childhood from trying to take care of a parent, either a narcissistic parent or like Denise was saying, an addicted parent. And it just really validated for me because I've always said, I believe on this show, but I know I've said it a hundred times on the Psychic Teachers podcast, if you look at the famous mediums, they all have at least one dysfunctional parent. And I think having to be tuned into the moods of one parent in order to get through that day is what turns on and strengthens everyone's innate psychic ability. Yeah, I believe it. That makes a lot of sense. I would not be surprised to see that with mediumship there is a childhood history of having at least one parent that the child, ha you know, they kind of learn to be really in tune to the parent to get their needs met. So um, that's an interesting, interesting study for sure. 
Well, I wanted to talk mainly in this hour about the effects that this has on the adult child, not on the child, him or herself, but what does the effect have on us as adults? Like for me, being raised with a narcissistic parent, I think the the biggest effect it's had on me is having to grieve the loss of that fantasy parent at different stages of my life. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like Like grieving having that that mom rush in and and make my wedding day beautiful or rush in and make my baby shower fantastic or rush in when I'm sick and not feeling well, like just having to grieve that loss over and over and over and having to realize those expectations aren't going to be fulfilled. Do you find that in your practice as well, that that it's kind of comes in waves of in cycles of revelation Yes, I really do think, you know, I think you really hit the nail on the head with um, with conceptualizing it as a grief process, because I think at our core, we all just want to be loved for exactly for who we are in, in an unconditional way and to feel that we can, we have someone we can come home to. And I think a lot of times there's, you know, it's really disappointing when you discover that your parent is maybe more interested in how you make them look or what you can provide for them than just being completely 100% okay with you just being you. And so I think it does become this sense of loss. There was there was always conditions when, when you needed something from your parent, there was a condition to it, not you can just go just because you need something and they're going to be there for you and you can count on that no matter what. So there is a lot of grief with that. I think that is completely accurate and a very commonly shared experience among everyone who grew up in in a household where that was the case. I think too, a lot of our, as empaths, a lot of our issues with wanting to isolate or having low self-esteem Uh, possibly being self-conscious, they all seem to tie in because, I I mean, I love geeky brain chemistry and everybody's heard that so many times. But if you go back to just, if you think about being a little tiny person and your your brain is 80% formed by the time you're four years old and your subconscious is 95% programmed by the time you're six, and that, you know, we could get into nature, nurture, all those things. But if your primary caretakers in those early stages of your life were extreme narcissists, you would develop those patterns so quickly, which kind of makes me wonder, do you come in as an empath or are you taught to be one? I think it's a combination of both. You know, I think when you're looking at narcissistic parenting, there, I kind of look at there's like six different characteristics that you'll experience in in a in that family and i believe what comes out of those uh six different experiences are six different messages that uh people kind of internalize and could you, could you tell us what those six are yeah sure so just as a kind of quick overview the the six characteristics that i kind of look at are value um narcissists will value their children for what their children provide to them not necessarily for their children's inherent value so they'll kind of see their children as an accessory or an extension of themselves the next one is criticism they'll use criticism as a tactic to avoid taking responsibility and to make themselves look better The next one is manipulation. So they'll use manipulation as a tool to get what they want. And they're not even necessarily consciously doing it. They just, they, they know what to say and how to work it so that they'll kind of get what they want. And then the flip side of that is retribution. When they don't get what they want, they'll use uh, rejecting the child or withholding love as a kind of a way of punishing and saying, you know, you need to do what I want you to do kind of thing. The, last two are taking ownership it's pretty rare that you're going to get an outright genuine sincere apology from a narcissist because they they almost kind of have the sense that they're above admitting to making mistakes which is a very normal part of parenting parents make mistakes as part of being human but you really won't see a narcissist apologize to their child or try to 
make things up to them. And then the last one is emotional nur nurturance. They have a really hard time connecting to their children on that emotional level and just, just being that safe place where the child can express emotions. So, um, so yeah, you'll see that kind of express like, um, you know, like with value, if you think of, it's, it's interesting, a lot of our, um, the stories we grow up with and things like that, you can, it's, it's kind of like how art is a reflection of life. You'll see narcissism kind of in different, different stories and take, for example, like the story of Snow White, you've got like this stepmom who is asking her mirror every day, who's the fairest in the land? And the, the magic mirror is like, well, you are, you are. And the, the mirror is like, well, you know, Snow White is, is next, but you're definitely at the top. And so the stepmom's like, yay, like, I am looking pretty good. And my stepdaughter looks pretty good. Like, we all look great. This is wonderful. And it, you know, then it kind of, it turns bad when the, on the day that the mirror is like, well, actually, Snow White is looking better than you today. And then that's when it all gets kind of dark. So definitely looks are a big deal. And the child has value in so much that they meet a need and, and help the parent to look better. So, so, but it's all superficial. Yes, it's, there's definitely a trait where there's more of a concern on um, looks over emotions and feelings. So what the child is experiencing doesn't matter to the extent of how does it look and reflect on the narcissist. I think that's uh, really important stuff, Alana, uh, to consider as far as as adults and as empaths, so many of us, and I, I don't mean this in an egocentric way, but we're, we're really good parents because we know we would never want our children to feel the way that we may have as, as little people or as young adults. And I think that that gives us, we're breaking that cycle, but we may tend at different times in our lives to attract partners who emulate those characteristics. So I think for, for our community of listeners, we're trying to find some techniques, some ways to, how can I take care of myself here and now? Yes, it happened this was part of my life story. This is part of my contract, however you want to look at it. But what are some ways we can take care of ourselves now to, to help break that cycle? Yeah, so definitely the first step, and this is kind of the first step when you're healing from anything, is recognizing that, you know, this is the case, that this happened to you, that you experienced this growing up and acknowledging it. And sometimes that's really hard to do because it can be easier to kind of, you know, turn a blind eye to it because it's really hard to admit, like, you know, my parent wasn't there for me uh, at all the time when I needed them. And um, I didn't get uh, the, the unconditional love that I deserved growing up. And so having to kind of come to terms with it and admit it, kind of like what Samantha was talking about, about earlier where it's it's a grief process and part of grieving it is first of all acknowledging it so i think you have to acknowledge it and then i think it's important to look at those messages that got internalized throughout your childhood and um start confronting them with positive messages um, those, those messaging, you know, we can, they become very habitual and we've got to make new habits with new messages. So I think, you know, like for value where narcissists value their children for what their children provide to them, the message that the child gets is, well, I am worthless or I only have value to the extent that I meet my parents' needs. Um, with criticism where narcissists will use criticism as a tactic to avoid taking responsibility. So they'll criticize the child. The child internalizes the message, I am bad. With manipulation, how they'll use manipulation as a tactic, kind of use the child to get what they want. The child develops this message, I am powerless. And then, you know, with retribution, where they'll use harsh punishment as kind of a control mechanism, the child learns, I am unsafe. 
with taking ownership where they, they don't apologize, the child learns I am incompetent, and then emotional nurturance. Um, and this is really sad, but the child can kind of internalize that message, I am unlovable. So part of the work I think that needs to be done is looking at those messages. And, and you know, some of these messages are going to be um, learned more strongly than others, and there may be messages that the child doesn't internalize because again, these traits can exist on a spectrum and um, it, the narcissist may be stronger at uh, one of these than another. So they can be internalized in different ways, but whatever they are, looking at them, identifying them and re-challenging those and relearning, like I am lovable, I am worthy of love and I have value as a person inherently and I am safe. I am, I'm not in an unsafe situation, at least in now where I am as an adult, I am no longer unsafe and relearning all of those messages. I think that's, that's really important work to do. You know, I used to have these fantasies that if I, I don't know, won homecoming queen or became a millionaire or was suddenly famous, like I would get the love and approval that I always needed from my mom. Mm -hmm. And I started reading Elton John's memoir he just wrote. I don't know if you guys have checked it out yet. It just came out. It's really good. And he has this narcissistic mother. And she's awful to him. And she doesn't love or approve of him even when he's freaking Elton John. <laughs> yeah. And it just made me realize, oh, my gosh. Like, uh, there's the narcissistic parent, I think, always is going to hold that carrot ever farther. Yep dangling the carrot. That's exactly what I was just going to say. It's there. They dangle the carrot. And it, it's interesting, you know, Elton John's a great example because you will see a lot of times um, children who grew up in these environments, they become very, very high achieving. Yeah. It's almost like it really cultivates this. I got to do better. I got to achieve more. I got to be more successful and get more power and and they will work their butts off to get really far in life. The challenge becomes they don't, you know, get to just kind of enjoy life and um, relax into it and, and have great experiences because they're always on. They're always having to achieve, achieve, achieve. So you will see, you will see that happen a lot with children who grew up in these environments. And conversely, on the flip side, Sometimes what you'll see is children are like, well, I could never measure up, so why bother trying kind of thing, where they'll just almost kind of give up. So you'll have really high achieving individuals um, as adults, and then you'll have um, adult children or narcissists who are just kind of like, whatever, I might as well just kind of, you know, just I, exist. <laughs> I think it depends on the label you were given. I had a really good friend in college and her motto in life was F it, except she mm -hmm. said the word. And mm -hmm. I mean, I remember I'd be up studying till like two in the morning and she'd go, ah, oh, just F it. What, you know, what's going to be is going to be. So yeah. she had really embraced that rebellious model. But you know, what's interesting when Denise was correlating this with being raised by an addict when my dad was going through AA, we all had to go to family therapy. And I remember the therapist said, typically children of alcoholics, the oldest is the achiever, the middle is the comedian, and the youngest is the rebellious artist. And at the time, I was kind of rebellious and was an artist. And it fit for all of my, my sister. The middle is hilarious and funny and always kept us in stitches. And my oldest is an overachiever and is incredibly successful. But I remember in that group therapy, she said to us kids, be careful because studies show that half the children of alcoholics will marry alcoholics or become one. And that really stuck with us. And I'm really happy to say that none of my sisters or myself are alcoholics, nor did we marry an alcoholic. But it always stayed in the back of my head. And I'm wondering, is that true of narcissists? Do some kids of narcissists become narcissists almost as a defense mechanism? And do some kids of nar narcissists then marry narcissists? 
Yeah, you know, that's that's a, a very interesting question because narcissists love raising little narcissists and to the point of uh, is there a tendency to marry narcissists? I think there can be if this stuff isn't looked at and questioned. I think what can save a lot of kids, and by save, I mean they they gravitate towards more healthy uh, relational dynamics and patterns. I think if if kids growing up in a narcissistic family, if they have somebody else present who is not a narcissist, who loves them unconditionally and provides that nurturance, or they have exposure to other families where there are more healthy dynamics, they might look at those uh, relationships and kind of see those healthy dynamics and say to themselves, I want that. I don't want this like yucky feeling of not ever being able to get my parents' affection. I want to be in in this these healthy dynamics where um, there's like there's there's acceptance and where you feel acknowledged. And I want that. So sometimes if a child is fortunate enough to have like exposure to other types and ways of being, they will gravitate towards that. But then you will also have sometimes where um, as kind of a a coping mechanism or just because um, that's the only patterns you've ever really known or learned, you kind of learn, oh, guilt tripping people is how I get what I want and success is what, you know, makes me complete as a person. Then there can, in that sense, there can be a tendency to become a narcissist if you grew up in a narcissistic household. Because it's what's familiar. It's what you know. Yes. Yeah. There's a, there's a book that really talks about that in very brutal ways. It's called The Fantasy Bond. And mm-hmm. uh, he doesn't have as much as a hopeful take on it as you do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but he basically does say that we create these, these fantasy bonds with our narcissistic parent And then we recreate those in our friendships, relationships, and even work partnerships where we employ the same tactics that we use to survive a narcissistic parent with our personal relationships in adulthood. Yeah, I've heard of that book, The Fantasy Bond. I have not read it. Um, But yeah, that it's, it's, I think anytime you're growing up in any kind of environment, you absorb the messaging of that environment. And it, it takes kind of a conscious uncovering and looking at things and being like, Oh, hmm, is that, is that really, you know, is that really how I want to live? Is that really true for me? Is that, is that right? Like, look, it takes some conscious effort to kind of look at patterns and, and really evaluate is that really something that I want for in my life and as a part of my life? Um, otherwise, we just kind of, you know, operate out of habit and go along with what we knew and what, what we know and what we learned. It seems like a lot of people right now are stepping into a time of I'm ready to shift some things in my life. I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to reinvent myself. A lot of be- people are being nudged towards truly stepping into their power, their light, and their purpose with a sense they may have never had before in this lifetime. And I think part of that for a lot of folks is redefining relationships and recognizing narcissism or recognizing control tactics. And as with so many of us on the brink of truly stepping up and, and saying, you know what, namaste, thank you so much for those lessons, but that doesn't fit for who I am right now. What are some ways we can can take care of ourselves and move forward because I think we, there's so much uh, unrest in the world right now. And, and to me, I really think it parallels narcissism with, with a lot of the things that are going on globally, a a lot of the protests, a lot of the political situations, and I'm not going to go off on a rant, but I I think sometimes this, this uh, intensity about being not consumed with narcissism, but so hyper aware of it, almost fuels that collective energy a little bit. So, you know, I I say this over and over, whatever we can do to raise our our vibration to help someone else raise theirs is the key to fighting this polarity. 
And so what would be some ways, and, and believe me, I am the poster child for working with, <laughs> with being around narcissistic mm -hmm. people. So I, I, anyone who has been through this has my absolute deepest empathy and compassion. But I think we're at a point now where it's like it happened, we're done, and now we're ready to heal and move forward. And I think as a collective, how do we find each other and help each other out of this dark corner? Yeah, you know, my, my initial, uh, re like my initial thought to that is before we, I think there is something very valuable in, in relationship and in forming relationships in which there is being in healthy relationships allows us to relearn patterns that were ingrained in us from childhood that maybe aren't serving us well now. If we, if we can really work to formulate healthy relationships where there are new patterns and new ways of connecting to people, I think there is something immensely healing about that. At the same time, I think we also have to do work on an individual level. Denise, one thing that you said, I forget exactly how you worded it, but kind of like making meaning from what we went through as children, I think it's really important to uh, look at what we did go through and say, thank you for those lessons that, you know, that those are lessons that I have learned. And, and that's very empowering when we can look at it in that way and, and take them as lessons um, and move on from that. So certainly I think there's relational work that we can do and that will really be beneficial for us. And I also think that there's a individual work that is important for us to do as well. And there's a really great quote actually by Viktor Frankl who survived the Holocaust and talks a lot about making meaning from our life. And one thing that he says is what is to give light must endure burning. And I just love that quote because just kind of like, you know, the stuff that we went through resilience that we developed and that's, what gives us strength now it allows us to be really nice kind compassionate people but i think again another pattern is people are afraid they're afraid to open their hearts they're afraid to to open up to uh new friendships or new relationships because it's been so ingrained that am i going to attract the same person with a different face how can we find you know, and i think that's what we're a lot of us and, and as a collective again that we're working on is have I done my work to the point where I can lower that drawbridge and trust that I'll make the right choices in developing relationship with, with friends or with my work partners or with whatever it might be. And, and it feels energetically like we're at a real tipping point with that. Yeah. And when you did grow up in a narcissistic household, you really are, you, you're afraid to trust yourself because everything about your experience you know, like you might say, I'm sad. Your parent says, no, you're happy. So you don't really, it's, it's hard to find your ability to really trust your experience. And so that can be really scary when you are trying to connect with people and form new relationships. There's a vulnerability that is really important in relationships and it's hard to be vulnerable if you're you're kind of you're gun shy because you're like well it, you know every time I've opened up in the past like I've gotten really big hurt from it so I'm just going to guard myself and not even go there um, that can certainly be tempting to kind of like turtle back into our shells and and not put ourselves out there but I will say you know doing this work and identifying some of the patterns from that you experienced growing up in these households once you do that work you can you can much more easily spot narcissism and and uh identify unhealthy relational patterns with other people um, in relationships that you might form so it's kind of you know learning to trust yourself and also you know, looking at things from the knowledge that you've gained from your experiences. Well, and I also think it's about breaking the silence and talking about it and being open and honest about it. I, I'm not saying 
you know, listeners should go home to their family of origin and say, hey, mom or dad, I think you were a narcissist when I was growing up and here's how it hurt me. Because I don't know that that does any good. I don't think the narcissist has the awareness capacity to handle that. But being honest and open and talking about it with yourself, with your current loved ones, hopefully with your siblings, with the therapist, or even just with you and your journal or you and your prayer practice. But I think everything, especially in recent years, the Me Too movement, the I just watched this documentary last night called Who Am I Really? It's wonderful. It's about these two brothers who were abused as children and they never spoke about it. And they finally start talking about it on this documentary. And it, it just really hits home that silence is what enables this covert abuse to continue, whether it's in the subconscious patterning that was planted in us as kids or whether it's, you know, just currently still happening. But if we can, if you can talk about it openly and honestly, at least with yourself, that's a great step to start trusting yourself and to at least be vulnerable with yourself. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely the acknowledging piece. It's kind of like, you know, how do you, how do you put, you know, how do you put shame in its place? The best thing is to put out there, like, you know, the thing that you're ashamed about, just you know, state what it is, and then it just evaporates like that. I, you know, it is when you acknowledge and look at what happened and the impact it had on you, that that allows you to learn how to trust yourself because you are validating your experience and you're saying, this happened to me, and putting it out there. And, you know, I do think sometimes there is value and I would not do this without having a really good support system and, and doing it for yourself, not for your parent and having working with a therapist on this. But, and I think it depends on where your parent is on the spectrum and how safe you are in this situation. But I do think sometimes there is, is actually value to confronting the family member. Again, I say that with every caveat <laughs> um, and caution, but, but it's that that is part of the acknowledging piece and putting it out there and saying, this is what happened to me. This is the impact it had. This is how it affected me. I think there's really important healing work in doing that. Susan Ford does a lot of writing on that. If, if anyone's interested in reading her work, I think she does a lot of great work on that. So yeah, and, and a, really, a really good safe way to do this is do it in a therapy room, talk to a therapist about it and say, this is what happened to me. This was my experience. This is what I went through. And of course, that's, I'm biased because I am a therapist, but I do think there's something immensely healing about that. Another really good starting point can be to write all that out to write out and to try to see it from, and this is from personal experience, so uh, is to write it out, write that person a letter and mm -hmm. pour it all out in your heart. And if you can get to the place in the letter where you can acknowledge that they were coming from their truth and doing the best they could at the time, and it was never intentional to hurt you. And then for me, I, I from shamanic practices, I'll burn that and release it to the universe and I think that's can be really really healing and also it may give you the strength you need to be able to go into a therapy session and have more clarity on how to address things yeah letter writing is you know letter writing and journaling like I just can't can't recommend that enough because it allows you to take what's inside and put it one take it put it outside of you and and it becomes material. When you write it down, it becomes material and it becomes real. And so it's not that your experience wasn't real, but when you can see it in black and white and on paper and, and it just, it, there's just something about it where you feel that material nature of it. You're like, oh, this was real. This really was my experience and it happened to me. And it also helps you kind of slow down and look at it from a bird's eye perspective almost so yeah I just journaling letter writing and yeah burning it is great especially if you're worried somebody might read it that you don't want to burn mm -hmm. it absolutely it's a really really wonderful intervention 
Well, because you have to be honest with yourself. I can't remember the exact quote, but Carl Jung wrote that he can only treat the person that that individual represents to him. And until he can get to the core of their secret, he can't treat them. Yeah, you can only work with what's in the room. You can only work with what you are able to put out there to work with, for sure. Now, sometimes I write articles for BeliefNet, and they will give me topics to research. And recently, they asked me to do an article on how to love yourself. And when you write for BeliefNet, it's, it's pretty formulaic. Like, you have to put it into 50-worded paragraphs, and it's very structured. And so I'm looking at this structure and this huge topic of how to love yourself. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, where do I even start with, because believe that they like to have articles that are like six ways to love yourself or eight tips to get in, you know, that type of thing. And so I started doing research on that. And the research I came up with was so ridiculous. It was like, give yourself a manicure, say loving thoughts to yourself, make better choices. And I thought, well, this isn't going to help people. This is more self-care. Yeah. What would you say to an adult child of a narcissist who's really on this journey of trying to learn how to love themselves unconditionally, authentically? You know, I'm really glad you bring that up, Samantha, because I think that is, that's important for all of us. And it's especially important if we grew up in an environment where – um, we weren't loved conditionally. Our, their love had conditions on it. So that's kind of how we learned love is, and that's how we learn to love ourselves is conditionally. So this work around loving ourselves, it is such important work, it's, and it's, it's a lifelong work. And to that, there's – so – I think two things on that. The one thing that comes to mind is all the really good work that's been done on loving kindness meditation. It's also called meta meditation, M E T T A. Um, and people have researched that pretty extensively and um, found that when you are in a regular practice of loving kindness, basically what that is, is you, you center yourself, you, you say kind of a mantra to yourself, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I live in peace. You wish yourself goodwill, and you don't start wishing yourself goodwill. You start wishing um, things outside of yourself goodwill so you can work in towards yourself because it can be really darn hard to wish ourselves goodwill when we're not feeling it. So you, you start that practice of compassion and you cultivate that and it's so fascinating because that will actually change how our brain is structured and we will actually start developing new ways of thinking and new patterns and new habits. And self-love is it's a habit that we cultivate and it's work that we intentionally do. And it is, yeah, one of the most rewarding work that we can do. Um, but that is one really powerful way to do that. And then I think the other thing that comes to mind is those, those messages that, that I mentioned that we get from narcissistic households that we grew up in. I am worthless. I am bad. I am powerless. I am unsafe. I am incompetent. I am unlovable. So it's really interesting if you, if you break those down, each of those is a challenge to a different chakra. So I think when you start getting into it, um, really just nurturing the the different chakras like I am worthless, that's solar plexus, I am bad, sacral, I am powerless, throat, I am unsafe, fruit chakra, I am incompetent, third eye, I am un unlovable, heart chakra. At least those are what I think <laughs> that they align to. I think when you start working on your chakras and nurturing those, that's another way that you can start doing that work um, and start healing and promoting that self-love. Those are great tips. Now, do you find with the narcissistic parent that there are general patterns or that they each present very, very differently? Like I'm thinking of your Snow White example. And I remember growing up, whenever I had a success, my mom wouldn't necessarily celebrate it with me. She wouldn't 
downplay it, but it was just kind of like, well, yeah, that's what's expected of you. Like I remember when I was graduating, I had the this special colored robe. And when I got off the stage, she said, why do you have that colored robe and not everyone does? And I said, well, because I graduated with honors, remember? And yeah. she said, oh, oh, I did. I forgot that. And, you know, little things like that where I would have a success and it was kind of diminished. But whenever I had a failure, she was actually really good. I mean, she would nurture me with that failure and she'd say, oh, he means nothing. Don't worry about it. Or that job was crap anyway. You'll get something better. Do you find that typical of narcissistic parents or is that unique? That's actually incredibly common. You know, I don't know... I wouldn't say that they're doing this consciously, narcissistic parents, but they're, I think on a kind of an unconscious level, they're always kind of uh, modulating how much attention and empowerment um, is being, is being uh, granted towards the child. Like if there's a really big moment like graduation, well, the focus is going to be on the child, not on the parent. And so, you know, the parent, the narcissistic parent doesn't want the child to have the spotlight more than they do. So, you know, they are going to try to, to do something to bring that excitement and hype down so that there's not too much of that being put on the child. And then if there's, you know, something difficult happens, well, they're all about that because that highlights that the child is going through a difficult time. So they, it kind of makes them feel maybe a little better to be helping that because that kind of puts them in a more empowered position. Because remember, narcissists, they, they struggle with insecurity. So the way they compensate with that is they have to feel like they're superior or kind of in, in control, that kind of thing. That's really important to them. That's very well put. Thank you. Yeah, that really is. It just, it makes us think about all these different ways that it parlays into our present day life. Now, you were saying that with a lot of caveats, you should confront the narcissist or at least let them know in some way that this has impacted you. Do you think people should do that with this idea in their head of this is for me? not for the parent, like, yes. uh, you know what I mean? Like no expectations of how yes. they're going to respond. A hundred thousand percent. Absolutely. Yes. It has to be for you. And that's why I really think people need to work with a therapist on it because it doesn't need to be done in a certain way. At the end of the day, what the, the goal is, is for the adult child to take their power back. And sometimes the reason you might confront, and again, it's very dependent on your situation, what you grew up in, how safe it would be to do that. But the reason that you would confront a parent directly is because it's a way that you can empower yourself. You can stand up to your parent and share, these were my experiences, and be able to do that without feeling like you're having to cater to them and their needs this time it's about you and I think that would be the reason you would go into it not because you're expecting a certain outcome because parents are going to be who parents are and they're going to especially if there's really long-term ingrained patterns it's going to be very very hard for them to change but the point is that you're taking your power back so I would definitely do it with the if you did want to do it, I would do it with the guidance of, of a professional to make sure that it is the right choice for your situation and to be very careful and know what parameters you want to put around it. But yes, the point of it would be it's, it's healing work for you. Right. And I do find that they mellow with age. I don't think that narcissistic parents are as bad in elderly times as they are when you're growing up. Yeah, it can depend. I've actually had, I, I can think of some examples of clients that I've worked with who have confronted their parent and it's been very, very healing for them. And to my surprise, <laughs> to be honest, because I think doing this work, sometimes we can get a little cynical about it. But yeah, I've seen some good outcomes from it. Then again, like I 
just again you just got to be really careful with it do it with don't do it when there's like you know you're going through a, a crazy big move or life change or something like that do it when things are calm you're feeling like you're in a good place and you have a really good support system around you that yeah, would be I agree to do it. when I when I had my talk with my mom she's this was her answer well Honey, I didn't have Dr. Phil and Oprah growing up like you did. So <laughs> we parents didn't know how to do all of this stuff. But if, if I had had Dr. Phil, I, it would have been a totally different experience. Yeah, taking ownership. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's a really good example right there. <laughs> now, I have read all of Susan Ford's work. I've read all of Carol McBride's work. Oh, I really yeah. recommend them highly to people. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things both of those women recommend is if there is no change, there is no ownership, and the emotional manipulative abuse continues, that you should go no contact. What's your view on that? I, you know, I believe it is Susan Ford who suggests taking a, like, three to six uh, month detox and evaluating it from there. I think that's that can be a very valuable suggestion. Take, take some time off, basically. And then that can kind of get you out of it. Because, you know, then the tactics narcissists use, they keep you hooked in. So sometimes if you're able to step outside of that and you're not hooked in, you can look at it from a more objective perspective and look at the impact that it's having and make a more informed decision. So... Yeah, again, I would do that with professional help. I'm going to keep plugging therapists because I think, you know, there's so much support and, you know, somebody who uh, has a lot of uh, knowledge around this topic. There's, there's so much that they can help you out with. But I think, yeah, sometimes that can be very, very valuable. Just take a little break, uh, get some perspective on it. And then if you do decide, you can kind of make some decisions from there as far as like how you would want to engage with the parent and what you would want your relationship to look like them, what parameters look like with them and what parameters you would put around it, what boundaries you would put in place, um, those kinds of things. Intentionality is really big, especially when you're in a relationship with a narcissist. Yeah, I know I'm a huge fan of therapy and I, and I think it's important if you are going to get to this place of confrontation to continue with a trusted therapist to help you set new boundaries going forward. Yes, absolutely, because you deserve to be loved and you deserve to be respected. And there's, there's no reason for you to be um, in a position where there's repeated types of abuse and you're being used um, to supply a narcissist needs. And there are ways that you can still engage with a narcissist where you are not the supplier of, of their narcissistic needs. So uh, that being said, I think, you know, it's therapists are a really valuable resource for helping you learn strategies and figure out how to implement ways of, if you decide that this is a relationship I want to continue because, well, they're my kids' grandparents or whatever, there can be some, some things that you can, develop with your therapist that are unique to your particular situation that are going to really help you with that. So, yeah. Well, we, um, before we wrap up, we, we mentioned Susan Ford's work and Carol McBride. Are there any other books you would recommend listeners check out on this topic? Yeah. Carol McBride is great. I think she wrote, will I ever be enough? Susan Ford is great. Um, I don't know about, you know, there's, there could be more books about this, honestly. I think it's a really important topic, and it's a topic that needs to be looked at with compassion. There is a podcast that I think is really helpful. It's called Understanding Today's Narcissist. Um, I'm trying to remember. Hammond is her last name. I can't remember her first name, but that one is a pretty well-done podcast, so that could be another resource. Perfect. And I'll, then I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, awesome. I actually have a little self quiz people can take if they want to kind of evaluate if they might have been raised by a narcissistic parent or parents. So, How can people find that? So you can go to my website. It's www.life-tree-counseling.com forward slash blog. It's on my blog. So yeah. You so life-tree-counseling.com. 
Yes, dot com forward slash blog. Okay, perfect. We'll put that in the show notes too. Yeah, I just asked that question because so many of the books on narcissists tend to deal with being in a narcissistic romantic relationship, but there aren't a lot of books on growing up with a narcissistic parent. Yeah, definitely. The ones you mentioned, Samantha, are the ones that I'm familiar with and I think are some of the best resources, Carol McBride and Susan Ford. Yeah, me too. Um, I think that that's probably a hole in the literature that we could use some more work around. So I agree. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this on this really important topic that I, I really think we could dive into for like three more hours because there's so much that that people are still healing from being raised in this type of family. I, I think the strategies you recommended of therapy and self-love, especially the meta meditation are wonderful. And I hope people will take that and Google the meta meditation and learn how to do it themselves and check out some of the books we mentioned. And I hope they check out your work too at Life Tree Counseling. We'll put your website and that podcast you recommended in our show notes as well and on our Facebook page. But thank you so much for coming on, Alana, and sharing your knowledge with us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me. And I do just want to say to the listeners that it takes a lot of courage to a history of narcissistic abuse. And it, it really, and just to encourage people to, um, yeah, to, to, to find their own power. And I really appreciate Samantha and Denise, the work that you guys are doing on this topic. I love that you're featuring this topic on your podcast. And I feel so honored that you had me on and that I could be part of the discussion. And I'm a big Thank fan. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Thank also, you so much. Yeah, you clear my office between clients. So I just want to put that out there. They didn't pay me to say this, but <laughs> <laughs> it's really good stuff. And I'm really glad that, that you have that available. That is awesome. Thank you so much. I hear from so many people who use that in classrooms, but I love that it's used in therapy offices too. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. In fact, like I was sitting on my couch, which is where clients sit um, between sessions one day. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is going on over here? I went over, got that spray, sprayed it. And it was like, oh, I don't know. It's, it's good stuff. So I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. I love to hear that. Well, everybody, we hope you check out Alana's work, lifetreecounseling.com. We'll post all of that information for you if you um, are driving and can't write that down. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We'd love to hear from you all if you were raised by a narcissistic parent and want to share your story or ask a question or give us a suggestion or tactic that worked for you. You can email us, enlightenedempaths at gmail.com or message us on our Facebook page. As always, don't forget to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care, everyone.